Do you know what I did today? I bought a bike. A, a bunny? A bicycle. a bicycle. A bicycle? I thought you said a bunny. No, bunny. Yeah. No, they live in my backyard and they eat my tomatoes. Welcome everyone to the first in the Toronto Consorts web series. Today we're going to discuss Frescobaldi, that Italian crazy man, and our new recording, Frescobaldi and the Glories of Rome. Yeah, so I guess we should talk a little bit first of all about uh, who was Frescobaldi. Well, he was definitely a child prodigy, and his teacher Luzzaschi was a famous organist. He's not really remembered as an organist because most of his compositions were lost. But uh, he also learned the art of madrigals. Of course, the, the ladies of Ferrara, uh, where he was born and grew up, where uh, he would have heard them and he would have been influenced by their, that amazing expressive style, which, which he carried into his, his music. Uh, he was steeped in this kind of chromatic, expressive and playful uh, style. And he was the first really widely acknowledged composer to base his, his fame on the keyboard. But what sets Frescobaldi apart, really, is that at a very young age, he was in his mid-20s, he was appointed to the most prestigious organ post in the world, uh, the Cappella Giulia at the at uh, St. Peter's in Rome. And he also, he went to um, Antwerp for a year, I believe, as a young man. He did, we think he did also hear Svelink play. So it's interesting to think about their influence, and Svelink knew of him, I think, as well. So... We, um, it's interesting to see this influence they had, um, or at least their knowing of each other and their music. You don't know whether, whether he studied with Spaling. No, but he published his first, uh, his, his first publication was actually a, a set of madrigals, and that was published on a trip to the Netherlands with, uh, with uh, a cardinal, in a cardinal's entourage, and that was, what, 1608? Yeah, in fact, those were published in Antwerp, his, this, and it's the only book of madrigals that we have from him. It's too bad because he wrote quite beautiful madrigals. It would have been nice to see what he had, had written later on as an as a older musician. It would have been interesting. But anyway, they were, those madrigals were published in Antwerp on, you know, as a result of this visit that he had with the Cardinal's entourage. Um, in terms of the other music, which fits in with the recording, because, of course, we're a group that has um, a preponderance of singers and we have other instrumentalists. So when you're coming up with a program, something <clears throat> focused on a composer, Frescobaldi is particularly great because he has such a variety of music and seemed to be equally at home with writing for the church and writing more secular material. And it's kind of interesting because, uh, at least as far as it struck me, his sacred music is a little bit more conservative, perhaps owing to the purpose of it. Um, and his, his music for non-church use, his solo airs, his madrigals, and his instrumental music for keyboard, but also a little bit for um, other instruments, He's just got such a variety of repertoire that he seemed like the perfect subject for a concert program and also for a recording. Um, and it's nice that everybody has an opportunity to do something. Also with the concert, one thing we always are thinking about when we're programming the concert is how do we showcase everybody in the group? So we, we try to be egalitarian about that as well. And everybody's got something to offer. So it's really nice to share that. And with Frescobaldi's music, you have a great opportunity to do that while still mainly focusing on him. And we should also say that the program also features some of his contemporaries like Landi and Marenzio, people like this. So we have some, some other works to compare Frescobaldi to. And it's nice to see that he favors, you know, he shows up very well in the light, especially if somebody like Marenzio, who is kind of a virtuoso madrigal writer. It's interesting that you say that. I hadn't, it hadn't really clicked for me that, the, I mean, the Ave Virgo is glorious and so, just so beautiful. But the, the madrigals, so the, so the non, so the, the secular that we did, um, and this, a lot of your instrumental stuff was really playful. Yes. Very, like, dance music, really, a lot of it. And even the madrigals that, that we did, there was a whimsy to it that, um, I suppose, yeah, I suppose since he was right, if he was writing for like arguably the most important church in the world, have to be pretty serious, all those cardinals. 
I was thinking a little bit about this. You're talking about dance like music. And uh, one of the things I like to do just as a hobby in my life is to research family history, genealogy. It's kind of fun to figure out who we are, where we came from. And when it comes to composers, you can do a sort of musical genealogy. Who did they study with? Right. Yeah. What ideas were being used? How did they pass down? And so when I was thinking a little bit about this chat, I thought, I'll dive in a little bit and see what I can find out about Fresco Baldi. And I found an interesting little connection to the first program we did this season, Countryside and Court. And if we fast forward to Fresco Baldi, he's studied with, like you already mentioned, Paul, Luzatsky. Luzatsky studied with Cipriano De Rore. De Rore studied with Willert, who was the founder of the Venetian School. Willert studied with French composer Jean Mouton, and that's where we sort of lose the line. So then I ran to my countryside and court music, and I thought, okay, can I find any glaring connections between Fresco Baldi and 16th, early 16th century Brittany? And maybe I might have possibly found one. And if you can remember the song or the piece we did, J'ai vu la loup. Yep. Bum, 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 ba -da 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 -da. It starts with a one note motif and on the Fresco Baldi program, there is a canzona <laughs> that starts with that exact same motif. Bum, 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 bum. And however it goes on. Yeah. Da, 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 yeah. Bum, 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 da, 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 da. So I can't help but imagine was Jean Mouton walking down the streets of 16th century Brittany, passing some musicians playing and this little earworm embeds itself <laughs> in his mind. And generation after generation, it just sort of subtly gets passed down until we find Fresco Baldi in his studio thinking, hmm, I need a motif for a canzona. So I think there's 150 years or so between the two, but maybe it exists as a, as a direct line, maybe not, but... Well, there totally, there totally is validity, right? Because canzona, that's kind of one of the ways that... Uh people can identify canzonas. And in fact, an awful lot of canzonas um, start that way. It's got, And also a lot of chansons of the time of people like Mouton start that way. There's often this kind of rep repetitive pattern. And in fact, Frescobaldi is so important for instrumentalists with these little can canzonas that he wrote, because these are, they really are canzonas, which is for us, it's an early form of the sonata. It's where the sonata starts. And it's just so important because he's got that early Baroque concept of high part, low part, and the polarity between the two. So you have a treble part and you have a continual part, a bass part. Um, and they're so beautiful because they are these little miniature instrumental pieces where you might have 24 bars that are fast, eight bars that are slow. Then you have another 16 bars that are fast and then another 12 that are slow. So it's kind of like mini movements and the whole piece can only be three or four minutes long, but it's this little miniature sonata. There are many of those songs that are written over dance bases from the Renaissance, which is another rabbit hole you could go down if you're looking for you know, more to go down with Frescobaldi because a lot of his instrumental pieces, as but a lot of the solo arias are based on these bass lines that we have from the Renaissance dance bases, like the Romanesca and the Passamezzo. So when I was thinking of how do we program this, I thought we have to include keyboard music because of who he was. But I also thought this is a great opportunity to just revisit the canzonas, which is what I went to after I heard these masterclasses. I, I started, well, what can I play of Frescobaldi? And it's always the Frescobaldi canzonas that I start students with when they're when they're trying to get into 17th century Italian. And there are there's repertoire that's based on his from a generation after him, but it's usually quite complex already. And if people get into that too soon and they miss the playfulness and they miss the essence of small structure that Frescobaldi gives, he's got these beautiful little bites. It's kind of like a lot of little hors d'oeuvre. It's like, oh, here, have some, have the, you know, 
this and then have that. And, and it's just so beautiful. It's an important thing that, that people shouldn't miss when they're learning. I'm wondering, like, do singers feel the same way about the arias? Do you have the same impression about them that I did about the canzonas? I had more of an impression in the madrigals. It was, um, I'm very interested what you hear, what, what you said about little, little bites and snippets. Um, for me, I guess it's a, it's a, and I'm not a sportive person, but it's a sports imagery for me that I, in those five part madrigals, which they mostly were, it was like a baseball team and you had to be completely aware of who had the ball and mm -hmm. it was not always you. You would throw the ball, the way he writes the voice leading, um, somebody has the ball, throws it and you have to be aware of who's catching it. Oh, it's coming to me now. Oh, but I got to throw it here in a way that is totally unlike Monteverdi, mm -hmm. totally, really totally unlike the English madrigals. English madrigals are somehow so, more solid. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like if it's a four or five part voice, you, you're all kind of going dun, 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 along. And with Fresco Baldi, it's like bing, bing. Now I don't, ha I have to say, I'm not as familiar with the Monteverdi madrigals as I am with the operas and well, I've done, you know, a million Vespers. So I know a lot of the bigger repertoire of Monteverdi more than the Madrigals. I suspect some of the ones that we're going to do in the end of next year's uh, program will be more like the Frescobaldi. But it was interesting to me that I really needed to reassess, go back into what I know about text, about expressing text just not just for myself, but in the context of four other voices mm -hmm. that we're all having a conversation. I had to re really reanalyze that for myself um, in a way that I haven't done in a long time. Yeah, and I found that there's this, set, it felt to me in, in singing these pieces that we were part of something, but also very independent in terms of yeah. the lines. And so it at first can be a little disorienting. You know, when you're learning these pieces and working your way through, you get this sense that you're all alone mm -hmm. and yet your point, your part is never unimportant. Right. If that makes sense, like it, it, yeah. it always has a function dramatically, musically. It may not be the one holding the ball to use your, your, yeah, your exactly. metaphor, but it's, it's important. And then, and the spacing between the voices at times too can feel mm -hmm. like there's, we're spread out. It was a very interesting experience for me to to have to move backwards in a way, in a way that I had not, uh, and relearn some stuff that I used to know that was still there, but I had to bring it forward. Well, I just think it's really, I, I mean, I think part of the idea of the program too was that the Toronto Consort has a great group of singers, and there is this repertoire that you guys could be doing so much of, and, you know... Uh, we always do a few madrigals or a few chansons in most programs, but this it, it just seems so important to actually maybe focus on this one person and do a few of these madrigals, which aren't also, I have to say, not very often performed and not very much recorded. So it was really great to be able to do that. But I just thought yeah. we have these great singers in the group, so let's use this. And it was really interesting to me because not being a singer, I don't know what's hard and what's not. Um, and I thought, oh, these don't look too bad. But then you were all, ooh, this is this is tricky. Oh, this is oh, this is upping my ante. I haven't done this in a long time. Yeah. And I thought, it was, oh, it was, well, it was universal. All all five six of us. Um, I don't think there were any six part, but the but you know but the, the switching around of the five voices, we all felt, ooh, boy, we have to really, we had to really pay attention and to get this music to a level that any of us, I think, found at least acceptable. It took <laughs> more work than a lot of the other repertoire we do because it was so unfamiliar. I, to my eternal shame, can say that I had never sung Frescobaldi before this program. I was very, I was very glad that we did a program that was so intensive, and mm -hmm. we, and that we have now made plans for further sort of focusing in on one specific um, composer and what yeah. what they have to offer. So, um, And Paul, I also think, you know, because of the keyboard solos and um, 
you know, on the on the recording, we have one organ and one harpsichord, and then one of the bonus tracks. There are also the bonus tracks where there's another solo of yours, as opposed to playing continuo. I mean, is is this is? I know you get to do this in many many programs, but can you like having to play sort of quite tricky solos as well as play a lot of continuo? Is that a kind of a, a bigger demand on you than usual, or? I wouldn't say it's bigger. Uh, I mean, I've been playing Frescobaldi since my student years, and right. he's I mean, he still has held up as a paragon of, of counterpoint. Uh, and you know, even Bach had a, a wrote out a manuscript copy and signed it in 1714 of Frescobaldi's works. They were they were hard to acquire. Uh, I mean, li editions were limited, and many things uh, were in, were spread around by by handwritten copies and there's now a thematic catalog at Duke University which has you know many many doubtful attributions and maybe some uh, his handwriting has been identified so some of them are definitely real and they were not published so people were learning about about his uh, style whether they had access to the, the printed editions or not but to get back to my involvement you know as a player uh, I mean, I, I've experimented with reading Frescobaldi in the original open score, which is, is not easy to do because you're reading four staves, <laughs> usually four staves, and uh, the parts are crossing each other. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it would have been quite a challenge. I mean, all, almost all the keyboard music of this period and earlier, Lutsaski's as well, was written in open score. Uh, modern editions use, uh, you know, two staves usually. Uh, occasionally three with uh, with organ music, but with Frescobaldi, not so much because the pedals were were only really used for cadences and for long held notes. There there were no uh, active pedal parts. But the, the, in terms of playing continuo, of course, I mean the the ideal of continuo playing at this time was really to be able in, to improvise counterpoint. It wasn't simply playing chords over a bass line. It was actually to, to compose counterpoint. And uh, this is something that Elam Rotem brought up and and something that he's pursued very interestingly. And, and you know, several players will pursue it. I mean, it's one thing to improvise in the style of the music you're playing. It's another thing to actually compose counterpoint uh, ex tempore. You know, right. it, it actually takes a bit of practice and it's something that we, <laughs> it's a lifelong project as it were. It's a, it's a personal growth opportunity is yeah. what it is. It's a personal indeed, growth opportunity. Indeed. But when you look well, at Frescobaldi, I mean, and his 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 ideas just there's just this overflowing ideas, and he manages to accommodate them, all kinds of different ideas, even in the same piece. In his very last piece, Cento Partite sopra Pasacaglia, uh, is is a is an incredible long set of variations on the Pasacaglia theme. But inside it, he interpolates little unrelated pieces, and it and it's beautiful. It all fits together. It's uh, it's quite amazing. And that was that was kind of his. His uh, his final his final word. I always find interesting what you what you see. For example, with Frescobaldi, what's interesting is if you have a group that that does a lot of earlier music, then when you hear them doing Frescobaldi, you have a very different take on Frescobaldi than you will have from a group that does a lot of Baroque music and is looking at him as old-fashioned or early. Right. And it's quite it's quite fascinating to see what your take is. And you start wondering, OK, I guess I really do do a lot of later music and he seems early to me or, oh, I love, do a lot of early music, earlier music. And he seems quite newfangled. He seems quite uh, a new horizon to me. Right. And so he's it's like really looking good for a different pair of glasses. Yeah. So with regard to the actual recording of the project, I mean, we did the, we had the concert and then we decided let's um, record it. And so it was interesting because prior to uh, this recording, one thing that was different in the process was that we went to the Glenn Gould studio to do this recording. Yeah, I think it might be interesting to talk a little bit about um, what it feels like to perform these pieces live in, in, a, in a hall compared to, and, and to practice for that kind of experience, which is what we do, and mm -hmm. to perform these pieces for recording because it was very different, right? When we perform in a hall, we're using the, the acoustic of the space, the way that we are, position ourselves, the way that we um, think about blend and phrasing it's based on a live 
experience in that space. And then when we move to a studio, that all changes. There's the acoustic in the space, of course, is very important, but we're being miked now. And what goes into those mics is what we hear on the recording. Yeah. And, and it's suddenly, somebody else's ears, it's not necessarily our ears. I find that so hard to give that up. And then we were spread out separately. And this is the, the nature of recording, obviously, but it is a, a different process. And I remember feeling, um, having to adjust to that and think about that, right? In, in no recording prior to this that I have been a part of with this group had we ever had earphones. It had always been sort of picking up essentially our own sense of, it was like we were performing. So we were using our own ears and our own sense of our sound and that was recorded. This felt to me more, I had less contact of my own and more contact through the machinery. I think the results came out really well. I mean, the mm -hmm. new engineer, I agree. What, what, was, what was also interesting to, to note is that, I mean, Ed Marshall had worked at the Glenn Gould studio for, for many, many years. Right. And, the guy, and, and Ron Searles, who was the engineer on this project, also works at CBC. He's one of the senior, senior engineers now. And he also does a lot of remote recording of classical and early music as well. And this was also the first recording where we have, you know, because Corey and Esteban are our core members now, but this was the first recording that we made with the group, um, with the new members. And we also had a guest with uh, Margaret Gay playing Baroque cello on it, which I was really glad to have her there. There's just extra bass line. Everybody can hear bass line more clearly. And she's so flexible. And so if you have to do something 15 times over, she's got no problem. And it'll be exactly the way it's supposed to be 15 times over. So was that great. was really great. But then also it's interesting because for me, um, it was the first time because, of course, what happens after the recording process. I've been involved in many recording projects before where I have had to help with the post-production, which after you walk out of the studio, then somebody has to listen to all the takes. Somebody has to decide which are we going to use. Um, and then you go through the editing process with the, with the engineer. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I was responsible for that. So I went out, I had many trips out to Ron's house and it was very pleasant. But the situation with that, too, is um, you have you make a few versions of the edited final product because, you know, you, you choose something and then, oh, maybe we should just adjust that one beat later, something like that. So it's quite detailed. You can only do it for about three, three and a half hours at a sitting. And then you're, um, you're done. And then you like, just you can't sort hear of like, anymore. I can't hear anymore. No, no, make it stop. Make it stop. <laughs> at the at the end of the day, Allison, how many how many hours did you put into editing? Um, I'm trying to remember how many. I think the actual in the studio with Ron might have been 20, 24. Wow. And then and then there's the listening beforehand. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go through all the takes and that can be quite entertaining because, of course, the cussing and swearing and, and people's, you know, sort of mental self immolating um, that goes on. And you, you get to relive it all, <laughs> all again, it. but it's but it's quite it's quite fun. And to see it's also fun because as you're listening to all the takes, you're also hearing how the piece is evolving as people gradually get into it. Because there's always this, okay, first time through, it may be good, but you're just warming up. And then there's a, a certain point where things start to lock in. Yeah. And then there's a point past which a take is not really so useful unless you need a little patch mm -hmm. somewhere. But it's quite a fascinating process. It's just not for the faint of heart, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> And I have to say, as the person who edits, it's, there's always this anxiety when you're doing it that even though you feel you've done your best, there's always this anxiety that, okay, when they hear this, will they think it's okay? Because, again, the other thing that you are dealing with in a recording studio in particular, when you're making the recording, I feel very strongly about this, that you, you, when you are being recorded, you are much more often much more critical of yourself Meanwhile, everybody else who's with you thinks you sound fine the whole way through. But it's an interesting thing. And you know that you're thinking, you're listening through and you're saying, I think that sounds great. 
whenever I hear Laura saying, I think this sounds great, and I hope Laura thinks the same thing when she hears right. this version. It's so personal. Yeah. Even what, not only what, 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 what you produce, Allison, for instance, is very personal. I've often said, I don't know how I can tell it's Allison playing. She's blowing into a piece of wood, but I can tell when it's Allison playing. How is that possible? So not only is it what you hear yourself, but it's what I hear and what Corey hears. And those yeah. things are not the same. I have to say, uh, to uh, give credit to Esteban, because the thing I was most terrified of was editing the loot pieces. Because first of all, the music is in tablature, which I can't read. Right. And I just and I don't know the pieces, and so right. he offered he offered to do the editing, which I am eternally Bless grateful. Him. Anyway, so we're very lucky also that we have this uh, partnership with Marquee Classics, yep. so that we knew and we had a welcoming label that was interested in releasing this. You can get it from um, MarqueeClassics.com, and you can also get it from uh, Amazon physical copy or download. And it's also available on all other um, download sites and streaming sites. So I think that's it for our conversation on Frescobaldi and the glories of Rome for today. You've had some insights into Frescobaldi and his composing style and to and our performing of it and and our recording of it. Stay well. Take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.